Okay. So, this gets us to our next question that is 101. Pathogenesis of hypochromic anemia in lead poisoning, it is due to inhibition of enzymes involved in heme biosynthesis. Question 101, the answer is A, that is lead, it causes inhibition of enzymes. It causes inhibition of enzymes involved in heme biosynthesis. Involved in heme biosynthesis. Next point, so which are the enzymes which are inhibited? Inhibition of enzymes, so which are the enzymes which are inhibited? There are three main enzymes which are delta amino, which are delta amino levulinic acid, levulinic, levulinic acid dehydrase, delta amino levulinic acid dehydrase. Next, red cell pyrimidine 5 prime nucleotidase, pyrimidine pyrimidine 5 prime nucleotidase pyrimidine 5 prime nu nucleotidase and ferrochelatase and ferrochelatase from biochemistry you very well know that these three enzymes are needed for heme synthesis they are inhibited by lead they are inhibited by lead so it causes inhibition of enzymes involved in heme biosynthesis next point because of inhibition of enzymes it he, iron will not be incorporated in heme in turn leading to microcytic hypochromic anemia in turn leading to mchc microcytic hypochromic anemia next this gets us to our next question that is 102 Identify the lesion of the lung based on gross morphology. See, in, in this case, even arrows were not needed on the gross. What you see here are multiple discrete nodules called as cannonball lesions seen in metastasis to the lung. These are the, these are the multiple cannonball lesions. They are multiple cannonball lesions. Let me write it clearly. Question 102, the answer is C, that is metastasis to lung, because what we saw in the image were discrete nodules, what we saw in the image were discrete nodules, which gave in turn the cannonball appearance, called as cannonball lesions. You as such know that lung and liver, the most common the most common malignancy of these organs is metastasis. So most common lung malignancy, most common lung malignancy, metastasis. Metastasis, these were the metastasis to the lung, cannonball lesions. Next, most common primary lung malignancy. In India, squamous cell carcinoma, west, adenocarcinoma. We have already made that list. I'm not getting into that again. Next, this gets us to the next one, 103, 103, that is young female, hyperflexible joints, tall, long fingers, fingers, double jointed. So what is the diagnosis? Marfan's syndrome. We have just seen around, we have just seen Marfan's around 10 questions back, Marfan's. Which disorder is associated? It is associated with dissecting aortic aneurysm, which is the most common cause of death, death and mitral wall prolapse. That is option 5, which is the, which is the most common CVS lesion. So answer is D. Answer is D. That is 1 and 5. Most common cause of death most common cause of death was dissecting aortic aneurysm most common cause of death was dissecting aortic aneurysms versus versus the most common cvs lesion most common cvs lesion associated with marfan's which was which was mitral wall prolapse mitral wall prolapse Next point. Next point, we have already seen this. Diagnosis in this case was Marfan's syndrome. Marfan chromosome 15. We have seen autosomal dominant 15, fibrillin 1, gene abnormality, FPN1. We have seen that. Next, this gets us to our next question. That is question 104. This gets us to the next one. That is question 104 assertion reason type 
assertion reason. Option A, TP53 ke tumor suppressor gene is most frequently mutated in human cancer. This is true. See, dekho bache. Whenever you are doing an assertion reason question, read both the statements individually. See whether they are true or false, and then see whether reason is the true statement for reason is the correct reason for assertion. So assertion P53 most frequently mutated. This is true. Next, loss of function mutation causes no cell cycle arrest at G1 via P21 and no DNA repair via GAD45. This is also true. And reason is the correct explanation for assertion. That is because of this, because of this, it is associated with human cancer. So answer is one. That is both assertion and reason are true and reason is the correct explanation of assertion. 104, the answer is A. Assertion and reason both are true plus plus reason is the correct explanation of assertion reason is the correct explanation of assertion now let us see this in more detail let us see this in more detail because of ionizing radiation because of ionizing radiation carcinogens ionizing radiation carcinogens carcinogens or mutagens or mutagens that is the the substances which cause mutations because of these in a normal cell because of these a normal cell a normal cell undergoes dna damage a normal cell undergoes dna damage it undergoes DNA damage. Let me write this in a slightly better manner. Because of these, a normal cell undergoes DNA damage. Because of which, because of which, P53 accumulates. P53 accumulates, accumulates and binds to DNA. It accumulates and binds to DNA, which has four main effects which has four main effects that is it causes senescence it causes senescence p21 p21 which is a cyclin dependent kinase cdk inhibitor p21 we have already seen what helps in crossing the checkpoints cyclins binding to cyclin dependent kinases CDK inhibitor is P21, which causes G1 arrest, which causes G1 arrest, which is the, there are two main checkpoints, G1S, G2M, we have seen this. What P53 stops at which checkpoint, G1S or G2M, predominantly at G1S. P21 is a CDK inhibitor, so it causes G1 arrest, in turn, in turn leading to repair in turn leading to repair. Next, the third effect of P53 is GAD45. It is GAD45. GAD45 in turn or causes DNA repair. GAD45 causes DNA repair helping in cell repair. And in case the DNA repair is unsuccessful, that is, if the DNA repair fails, it causes apoptosis. If the DNA repair fails, it causes apoptosis. And the last effect of P53 is it causes activation of Bax. Bax also in turn stimulates apoptosis. Bax stimulates apoptosis. This is the effect of P53 accumulation and binding to the DNA and binding to DNA. This was a normal cell. So in a normal cell, in a normal cell, P53 causes repair and apoptosis. In case of a mutated cell, 
that is in case the cell mutation is seen p53 mutations are seen in case of mutations in case of mutations p53 dependent genes are not activated p53 dependent genes are not activated they are not activated as a result as a result there is no dna repair no apoptosis there is no dna repair no apoptosis no apoptosis which in turn leads to expansion expansion additional mutations expansion and additional mutations in the cell in turn causing tumor in turn causing tumor this is the mechanism by which p53 prevents tumor formation and how it causes the tumor and how it causes the tumor so coming back to our question p53 prevents tumor agreed loss of function no cell cycle arrest and no dna repair via cat 45 both are true and reason is the correct so uh, reason is the correct explanation for the assertion next question 105 which regarding bombay blood group is false bombay phenotype they lack hab antigens they lack these substances in saliva agreed lack antigens of several blood groups no statement 3 is false antibody will always be present yes so question 105 question 105 the answer is c that is bombay phenotype bombay phenotype lack antigens they lack antigens of several blood group systems lack antigens of several blood group systems this is false so before we go further let us look at this from the beginning now abo blood grouping abo blood grouping it is present on chromosome 9 chromosome 9 chromosome 9 it leads to the formation of a basic chain that is h substance it leads to the formation of a basic chain that is h substance on this h substance if a product is added it is a blood group if b product is added it is b blood group whereas o is the amorph gene that is no product is added but h substance present or absent h substance is present this is normal this is normal next now starting with bombay phenotype bombay phenotype first point in bombay phenotype h substances absent h substances absent next if h substances absent will a or b antigens be present no on the h substance a product and b product were getting added to make a antigen or b antigen so all the antigens all the major blood group antigens major blood group is the abo blood group there are three antigens a h antigen a antigen and b antigen all the major blood group antigens are absent are absent next point suppose somebody has a blood group which antibody will he have anti b antibody whichever antigen is present we have antibody against it so all three antibodies that is anti h anti a and anti b antibodies are present the antigens are absent but the antibodies are present next point so bombay phenotype can donate blood to everybody because when we are donating blood we are giving the antigen it does not have any any antigen so it can donate blood to everybody but but can receive blood but can receive blood only from bombay phenotype only from bombay phenotype why we cannot even give him the o blood group 
O blood group has H antigen. Bombay phenotype has anti H. So we cannot even give him O blood group. Last point. Last point. Put a star on this. Antigens of minor blood group systems. Antigens of minor blood group systems. Minor blood group systems. They are MN, Kel, Duffy, RH. Antigens of minor blood group systems are not deficient. Are not deficient. It is associated only with the deficiency in major blood group antigens, not in the minor blood groups. Not in the minor blood groups. This is Bombay phenotype. This is Bombay phenotype. Next, this gets us to our next question. That is question one zero six. That is one zero six. So let us have a look at the question. 40 mil splenectomy, peripheral smear would show the presence of and the answer is so post splenectomy we see howl jolly bodies and cabot rings. So 106 the answer is D that is howl jolly bodies, howl jolly bodies. So before we go further let us have a look at abnormal RBC micro abnormal RBC morphologies normal RBC morphologies first point first point an isocytosis this is altered size yes, shape of the RBC altered altered size of the RBC altered size of the RBC so it is an in an isocytosis is indicated by RDW red cell distribution width RDW, red cell distribution width. What is the variation in size of the RBC and isocytosis versus or alteration in shape of the RBC, poikilocytosis versus poikilocytosis, which is altered shape of the RBC. Altered shape of the RBC. Next point. So let us now start with abnormal RBC morphologies. Abnormal RBC morphologies. Starting with the first one, that is echinocytes, echinocytes or bursils, echinocytes or bursils. These are the RBCs in which spicules are present. Spicules are present on RBCs which are equal in size and are equally spaced, which are of equal size and are equally spaced bar cells or echinocytes this is the most common artifactual change most common artifactual change in rbcs that is nothing is wrong with the patient while making the slide this happened so we don't even report this bar cells or echinocytes next next is spur cells next is spur cells or acanthocytes spur cells or acanthocytes this shows the presence of spicules on rbcs which are varying sizes spicules on rbcs which are of varying size and are unequally spaced varying size and are unequally spaced most commonly associated with liver diseases, spur cells or acanthocytes. Next, next is spherocytes. You know this very well. Spherocytes, they are associated with HS, hereditary spherocytosis and autoimmune hemolytic anemia, AIHA. It also shows spherocytes in peripheral blood. Next, bite cells, bite cells. G6PD deficiency. What is the inheritance pattern of G6PD? X-linked recessive. You know that. Next, next is Howell Jolly bodies. This was what was asked in the question. Howell Jolly bodies and cabot rings. Howell Jolly bodies and cabot rings. They are seen in megaloblastic anemia. They are seen in 
megaloblastic anemia and post splenectomy megaloblastic anemia and post splenectomy next point hovel jolly bodies they are also seen in thalassemia they are also seen in thalassemia hovel jolly bodies and cabbage rings next next is the presence of uh, basophilic stippling basophilic stippling you know this very well basophilic stippling lead poisoning this has been asked so many times that now they do not even give the option of lead poisoning so if this is not given the next option that you will mark is is thalassemia thalassemia and the next is megaloblastic anemia megaloblastic anemia so basophilic stippling the answer has to be marked in this sequence next which is the most alarming rbc morphology most alarming means most indicative of hemolysis most indicative of hemolysis is the presence of schistocytes most indicative of hemolysis schistocytes schistocytes seen in maha <laughs> seen in maha which stands for microangiopathic hemolytic anemia seen in maha microangiopathic hemolytic anemia maha so this gets us to the important list of diseases associated with maha they are they are hdic hus ttp disseminated intravascular coagulation hemolytic uremic syndrome thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura next pnh paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria pnh help syndrome help syndrome finally onwards i'm sure everybody knows this nobody passes obs gynae without knowing help syndrome hemolysis elevated liver enzymes low platelets next march hemoglobinuria march hemoglobinuria is seen in which month march nahi bache it is because of the soldiers marching because of marching there is trauma to the capillaries of the feet march hemoglobinuria these are the these are the diseases with maha next point let us write two points with hus and ttp hemolytic uremic syndrome this is shiga toxin mediated this is shiga toxin mediated which shiga toxin o157 h7 you know this better than me from microbio next ttp thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura ttp this occurs because of adam ts13 deficiency this occurs because of adam ts13 deficiency adam ts13 this is an enzyme which breaks down von willebrand factor if von willebrand factor is not broken down it, it leads to increased thrombosis in turn leading to thrombocytopenia thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura these are the abnormal rbc morphologies so before we go further let us have a look at what they look like microscopically starting with the first image diagnosis what you see here are the normal size and shape of rbcs all the rbcs they have central one third pallor they have the central one third pallor this is normal this is a nice normal peripheral smear this is what normal looks like this is a lymphocyte lymphocyte all these small small ones they are platelets normal differentiate this from this slide what you see here are the characteristic bite cells all the cells that are bitten off bite cells seen in g6pd deficiency g6pd deficiency next diagnosis this was normal as compared to normal these rbcs are they smaller larger larger they are macro ovelocytes they are large and oval in shape macro ovelocytes which is a feature of megaloblastic anemia macro ovelocytes they are the characteristic rbc morphology in megaloblastic anemia next point 
have a look at this cell extremely important this is a nucleated rbc you're able to see the presence of a nucleus with a fully hemoglobinized cytoplasm the nucleus is still immature whereas the cytoplasm has matured nucleocytoplasmic asynchrony nucleocytoplasmic asynchrony that is nucleus and cytoplasm they are not in synchrony with each other they are not maturing together which again is a feature of megaloblastic anemia next diagnosis showing you this is a spot of hyper segmented neutrophil showing you a hyper segmented neutrophil what is a hyper segmented neutrophil it is a neutrophil with more than five lobes more than five lobes in a single neutrophil or or five lobes five lobes in five percent neutrophils hyper segmented neutrophil count the number of lobes one two three four five six hyper segmented neutrophil next diagnosis again a spot of the rbc's they are much smaller in size and the central pallor is much more than one third look at all these cells the hemoglobin is present just as a peripheral rim and the central pallor is much more microcytic hypochromic rbc's what is the most common cause of mchc most common cause being iron deficiency anemia most common cause being iron deficiency anemia next this is a good slide diagnosis answer but you have a good look at it diagnosis blood cells a kind of side blood cells acanthocytes what you have here are spicules and rbc's equally spaced equal in size this is an artifactual change tell me the diagnostic finding in this slide which is the abnormal rbc this one which shows the presence of a hovel jolly body this is what hovel jolly body looks like hovel jolly bodies seen in megaloblastic anemia post splenectomy hovel jolly bodies next when you look at this slide is this stain the same as this one no of course not here the rbc's are red in color here they are blue so which stain is this this is a supravital stain supravital stain and the most commonly used supravital stain is new methylene blue the most commonly used one being new methylene blue supravital stain you very well know is used to count the number of reticulocytes so how many reticulocytes are there in this slide count 1 2 3 Four, five, six, seven. There are seven reticulocytes in this slide. Any RBC with a blue dot in it is a reticulocyte. Reticulocytes. Next diagnosis. Diagnosis. First, tell me which technique is this? Bone marrow biopsy. What you have here is the bony trabeculae with intertrabecular space. showing showing this is the intertrabecular space showing predominance of fat spaces all this white white is the fat all this is the fat whereas the hematopoietic cells these blue dotted cells are very less so if i had to give a percentage on hematopoietic cells they are less than 5% diagnosis aplastic anemia you very well know if bone mass cell lt is less than 25% diagnosis aplastic anemia aplastic anemia next diagnosis this again is a spot of which are the abnormal rbc's first spot the abnormal rbc's there are three these are the abnormal rbc's showing blue blue dots in the rbc's that is basophilic stippling basophilic stippling seen in seen in lead poisoning most common cause lead poisoning followed by thalassemia and megaloblastic anemia basophilic stippling basophilic stippling next next so before we go to the next question this takes care of abnormal rbc morphologies 
that is question 106, the answer was Howell Jolly bodies. Next question 107, identify the lesion of the liver. Now this is not a very good slide, what I am showing you is this slide. This was the characteristic nutmeg liver. Nutmeg liver, we have already discussed that nutmeg liver seen in chronic venous congestion. The answer is 4, that is chronic venous congestion. Question 107, the answer is chronic venous congestion of the liver. And the diagnosis, and the diagnosis was nutmeg liver. Nutmeg liver, we have already seen shows the presence of interspersed, it shows interspersed dark red areas, it shows the interspersed dark red, just a sec, interspersed dark red to brown, periportal ya perivenular, perivenular areas perivenular areas because congestion is around the central vein. There are two big areas in the liver, portal tract and central vein. Congestion is around the central vein. So dark red to brown perivenular areas with, with interspersed tan brown, tan brown normal periportal areas, tan brown normal periportal areas associated with associated with right ear left sided right sided heart failure associated with right sided heart failure this is nutmeg liver this is nutmeg liver and and this is what it looks like this is a nice good image what you see here are the congested with the interspersed normal tan brown areas nutmeg liver Next, <coughs> this gets us to our next question, 108. Now look at this slide in an unbiased manner. I know nothing about the question, nothing doing. What you, what you see here is a peripheral smear with presence of mature appearing lymphoid cells. All these cells, they are similar in size to an RBC. Mature appearing lymphoid cells with the arrow being marked on smudge cells. Diagnosis, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Without knowing anything about the question, I know that the answer is 1. So question 108, question 108, <coughs> the answer is, the answer is 1, that is CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which on peripheral smear shows a high TLC with mature appearing lymphocytes. Mature appearing means they are similar in size to an RBC. Next point, next point, along with the presence of smudge cells. Please note, smudge cells are most commonly associated with CLL, but they can be seen in other neoplasms also, other blood cancers, hematopoietic neoplasms also. Next point, the characteristic RBC morphology, which RBCs can be associated in a patient of CLL, spherocytes, spherocytes. Why? How do I how do I explain this? Because CLL is associated with which hemolytic anemia? Warm type. It is associated with warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So it it can be associated with spherocytes. Next, next point, the most common cytogenetics, most common cytogenetics in CLL is normal karyotype, normal karyotype, that is there is no cytogenetic abnormality, but the most common cytogenetic abnormality in CLL is deletion 13Q. So please see the question properly. Most common cytogenetics is normal, whereas cytogenetic abnormality is deletion 13Q. This is the most common. So good prognosis, poor prognosis, good prognosis. The one which is the most common usually has a good prognosis. Whereas the poor prognostic abnormalities, 
poor prognostic abnormalities are deletion 11 and 17. Deletion 11 and 17. Easy to remember 11, 13, 17. 15 is not there. Top bottom poor prognosis, middle one good prognosis. Lastly, markers. Markers, we have already discussed this. CLL, it is CD19 positive. It is a B cell neoplasm. It is CD19 positive. CD5 positive, 23 positive. 5 positive, 23 positive. Next, which is the best marker to differentiate CLL from mantle cell lymphoma? CD23, because mantle cell is 5 positive, 23 negative. This is CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Next, this gets us to the next one, that is question 109. Carcinoma stomach, secondary to pernicious anemia, location, fundus of the stomach. The answer is 4. Question 109, the answer is fundus of the stomach. We again have already seen this. Pernicious anemia, it is, an, it is associated with autoimmune gastritis. It is associated with autoimmune gastritis because of presence of antibodies against H plus K plus ATPS. Antibodies against H plus K plus ATPS and intrinsic factor. Next point, because of antibodies against H plus K plus ATPS, it is hypochlorhydria. HCL secretion reduces. Which hormone is needed for HCL? Gastrin. Gastrin increases hypochlorhydria with hypergastrinemia. Intrinsic factor, which is secreted by parietal cells of the stomach, responsible for absorption of vitamin B12 from terminal ileum. Antibodies against it is associated with pernicious anemia. Is associated with pernicious anemia. Important point here is sequelae. Sequelae of pernicious anemia. What can it progress to? It can progress to adenocarcinoma stomach, adenocarcinoma stomach, and carcinoid tumors, and carcinoid tumors. Why carcinoid tumor? Carcinoid tumors occur because of compensatory hypergastrinemia. Autoimmune gastritis was associated with compensatory hypergastrinemia, which in turn can lead to carcinoid tumors. Next question, which is the most common site of adenocarcinoma stomach developing after pernicious anemia? Answer, fundus of the stomach. Most common site, fundus of the stomach. This was just a recap. We have already done this when we were discussing chronic gastritis. Next, this gets us to our next question. That is question 110. Now, this is slightly long. 60 year male, smoker, 10 kg weight loss over the past 5 months. Next, reveals erosion of the entire gastric mucosa, erythematous, cobblestone appearance, stomach is shrunk and reduced. Which of the following is microscopy? So, gastric carcinoma, erythematous, cobblestone appearance. This is the classical leather bottle appearance of the stomach. So question 110, question 110, I have not even read the other options till now, but what it is showing me is the classical leather bottle appearance, leather bottle appearance of the stomach, leather bottle appearance of the stomach, which is linitis plastica, leather bottle appearance of the stomach, Linitis plastica. Next point, next point. Now, which of the following is the likely microscopic finding? Microscopically, microscopically, I can divide the gastric carcinomas on the basis of Lorentz histological classification. Lo on the basis of Lorentz histological classification, I can divide gastric carcinomas into two types. That is the intestinal type, intestinal type and the signet ring cell type. Intestinal and the signet ring cell type. Which has a poorer prognosis? 
Interstenial is the signet ring cell, signet ring cell type. This is associated with poorer prognosis, poorer prognosis and which mutation? Please put a star on this, E cadherin mutation, E cadherin mutation and, and grossly it has which appearance? L leather bottle appearance, linitis plastica, linitis plastica. This is the theory part. So, linitis plastica is associated with C, that is signet ring cell adenocarcinoma. Question 110, the answer is C, that is signet ring cell adenocarcinoma. Signet ring cell adenocarcinoma. Next point. Before we go further, let us have a look at what it looks like microscopically. Now, have a look at this image. Now, there are two areas in this, the top and the bottom one. Which is the affected portion, top or bottom? The bottom area, which is showing the presence of cells with an eccentric nucleus. All these, they look like rings. So, this is the classical microscopy of signet ring cell adenocarcinoma GIT, signet ring cell adenocarcinoma, which mutation? E cadherin, e Next, next. So this gets us to question 111. Let us have a look at it. Uh, seven year old boy, generalized edema, albuminuria, hypoalbuminemia, hyperlipidemia, electron microscopy. The minute you have hypoalbuminemia with hyperlipidemia presenting in a child that is child with nephrotic syndrome, diagnosis, minimal change disease, MCD, which on electron microscopy shows fusion of food processes at, at the glomerular epithelial cells. <coughs> so question 111, the answer is A, that is fusion of food processes, fusion of food processes of the glomerular epithelial cells of the glomerular epithelial cells and the diagnosis in this case I guess this is one of the easiest questions diagnosis in this case was MCD minimal change disease MCD let us have a look at MCD I'm sure though already you know this MCD light microscopy <coughs> light microscopy is normal or unremarkable it is normal or unremarkable, whereas, <coughs> whereas, sorry, the diagnostic hallmark, diagnostic hallmark is electron microscopy, which shows fusion of food processes of the visceral epithelial cells or protocytes. Next point, MCD, it is the most common, it is the most common nephrotic syndrome seen in children most common nephrotic syndrome seen in children. Next point, good prognosis, poor prognosis, good prognosis. It is seen in children. Let us have a soft heart for kids, good prognosis. So steroid responsive, yeah, resistant, responsive. It has a dramatic response. It has a dramatic response to steroids, has a dramatic response to steroids. Next point, Immunofluorescence. What is the site of deposit in MCD? There is no antigen antibody complex deposit. There is no antigen antibody complex deposit. So when there is no deposit, <coughs> when there is no deposit, of course there is no immunofluorescence. There is no deposit, no immunofluorescence. This is MCD, minimal change disease. Next point, before we go further, this is what it looks like. Now have a good look at the electron microscopy. This is an important question, important prospective electron microscopy based question. Have a look first at normal. The first slide shows you the normal visceral epithelial cells showing the normal food processes which are elevated versus diffuse effacement of the food processes of podocytes seen in MCD, seen in minimal change disease. This is normal. This is normal versus the second image, which is MCD. 
next next this gets us to our next question that is question 112 ferruginous bodies <coughs> ferruginous bodies are seen in asbestosis question 112 112 ferruginous bodies are associated with asbestosis so before we go further let us have a look at pneumoconiosis pneumoconiosis we have already seen the classification of restrictive lung diseases we have seen that now pneumoconiosis it is response of the lung to organic and inorganic both it is response of the lung response of the lung to both inorganic and organic particulate matter which is more common inorganic or organic inorganic is more common and organic particulate matter organic particulate matter next point the dangerous size of the particle we have again discussed that is it small intermediate or very large it is intermediate 1 to 5 micrometers if it is small it will be exhaled out <coughs> sorry if it is large it will not be we will not be able to take it to the alveoli so intermediate size that is 1 to 5 micrometers next point there are three main pneumoconiosis which are which are anthracosis anthracosis silicosis silicosis and asbestosis anthracosis silicosis and asbestosis anthracosis is associated with coal workers or coal miners silicosis is with sand blasting or stone cutting and asbestosis is associated with insulation industry that is the wires they have insulation over it insulation industry next point next point i'm just we have already made this table i'm just concerned with the microscopy here anthracosis microscopically shows the presence of coal macules <coughs> shows the presence of coal macules which are 1 to 2 millimeters in diameter coal macules which are 1 to 2 millimeters in diameter and and it also shows progressive pulmonary fibrosis coal macules and progressive pulmonary fibrosis which is 1 to 10 centimeter lesion which is 1 to 10 centimeter lesion this is anthracosis anthracosis next silicosis silicosis it is associated with sand blasting so microscopically now who will take up the sand particles macrophages so mi microscopically it shows central collagen central collagen with peripheral zone of with peripheral zone of dust laden macrophages central collagen with peripheral zone of dust laden macrophages next point silicosis it is also associated with eggshell calcifications it is also associated with eggshell calcifications that is around the lesion there is calcification which looks like shell of an egg eggshell calcifications and the last is asbestosis last is asbestosis which microscopically <coughs> which microscopically shows asbestos fibers and on these asbestos fibers if if a hemosiderin is deposited hemosiderin deposition on the asbestos fibers leads to the formation of ferruginous bodies leads to the formation of ferruginous bodies so this was the question ferruginous bodies are associated with asbestosis they are associated with asbestosis next and this is what ferruginous bodies look like what you see here just by looking at this microscopy you are not able to make out that this is lung i am telling you that what you have here are these elongated fibers with brown substance coated on them hemosiderin coated asbestos fibers ferruginous bodies <coughs> next this gets us to the next one now just have a look at this image no history slide just look at this image 
infection or tumor? Tumor. It is a clear cell tumor. How do I know that? It is showing you nest of tumor cells. The tumor cells, they are present in nest with the clear cytoplasm and a peripheral nucleus. It is a clear cell neoplasm. Now, let us have a look at the question. Hematuria, upper pole of the right kidney, after nephrectomy, this is what we see. This is clear cell carcinoma RCC or the conventional type of RCC. Answer B. <coughs> so question 113, question 113, the answer is B, that is clear cell carcinoma, clear cell carcinoma. Next point, another question that can be asked from this are the genetic, mark are the genetic markers or mutations associated with RCC. First point, if nothing is written, we mean the conventional, we mean the conventional or the clear cell RCC, which is associated with, which is associated with VHL mutations, von hippel lindau mutations present on chromosome, how many alphabets are there in VHL? Three, present on chromosome three. Next is, next is the chromophilic chromophilic or papillary RCC, chromophilic or papillary RCC associated with chromosome 7 or CMET mutations, chromophilic or papillary RCC, chromosome 7 or CMET mutations and the last is, and the last is chromophobe RCC. The name tells you it is phobic of all the chromosomes that is, it is associated with deletions or hypodiploidy. Deletions or hypodiploidy. Deletions or hypodiploidy. This is RCC, renal cell carcinoma. Next point. Next point. This gets us to the next question. That is question 114. <coughs> question 114. Which statement about telomerase is true? Answer, the increased telomerase activity, we have just, we just discussed this around 10 minutes ago. What we saw was telomeres are present at the ends of the chromosome. With each mitosis, the length of the telomere reduces. Telomerase is an enzyme which is responsible for maintaining the length of the chromosome. If the telomerase activity increases, the cell become, has increased mitosis or increased replicative ability which is associated with tumors. So telomerase causes carcinogenesis. The answer is B. Question 114, the answer is B. We have already, already seen this. It causes carcinogenesis. <coughs> it causes carcinogenesis. Please note, it does not have RNA polymerase. It is DNA polymerase activity. It is present in germ cells absent in somatic cells, <coughs> present in germ cells, absent in somatic. So option C and D are opposite. Next, identify the area marked. What we see on right hand side is the presence of a tumor. Forget tumor, forget everything in this. What on the, on the area where the arrow is marked, you are not able to make out the anything in this. It is showing you necrosis. Eosinophilia is increased, basophilia is reduced. Whereas on the right hand side, this is the viable tumor, which is showing you the presence of blue nuclei. So answer is B, that is necrosis. Question 115, the answer is B, that is, it was showing you necrosis. We have already seen the different types of necrosis, most common being coagulative necrosis. A subtype of coagulative was Senker's degeneration, seen with typhoid, Skeletal muscle was more commonly affected, that to the abdominal skeletal muscle. Next was liquefactive necrosis, caseous necrosis, gangrene. Gangrene was of two types, trigangrene, wet gangrene. Next, fat necrosis, and the last was fibrinoid necrosis. We have already discussed this in detail. Next, just as a recap, gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis, necrosis shows a diffuse smearing. It shows diffuse smearing versus apoptosis, versus apoptosis, which shows the classical 
step ladder pattern. We have, yeah, we have even drawn the image what it looks like. Next, this gets us to the next one that is question 116. <coughs> 116. Now, which of the following is autosomal recessive? Answer is 1. Ataxia telangiectasia. It is autosomal recessive. Butzeger, neurofibromatosis, and tuberous sclerosis. All three are autosomal dominant in nature. So, 116. The answer is A. That is ataxia telangiectasia. Ataxia telangiectasia. It is autosomal recessive. So, before we go further, let us have a look at autosomal recessive inheritance, the diseases associated with it. First point, all the metabolic disorders, first point, all the metabolic disorders like, like cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency, alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency, next Wilson's disease, Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis, hemochromatosis, next alkaptonuria, alkaptonuria, phenylketonuria, alkaptonuria, phenylketonuria, phenylketonuria, Gaucher's disease, Gaucher's disease, all the metabolic disorders, they are autosomal recessive. Next, next are the hematological disorders. The second category are the hematological disorders, hematological disorders, which are, which are sickle cell anemia, HBS, sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, thalassemia, they are, they are autosomal recessive. Next, diseases of innate immunity diseases of innate immunity which are which are leukocyte addition defect 1 LAD 1 leukocyte addition defect 2 LAD 1 which is a defect in addition LAD 2 which is a defect in rolling we have already seen this next Shidiak Higashi syndrome CHS which is a defect in phagolysosome formation autosomal recessive and the last is ataxia telangiectasia. And the last is ataxia telangiectasia. These are the autosomal recessive diseases. These are autosomal recessive in nature. Next, this gets us to our next question. That is question 117. Question 117. Approximate number of genes contained in the human genome, they are 30,000. They are approximately 30,000. Answer is B, 30,000. So, first point, first point, let us have a look at basics in genetics. Human genome, it has approximately 1.2 billion base pairs. It has 1.2 billion base pairs contained in 30,000 genes contain in 30k, 30,000 genes, out of which, out of which the coding region, coding region means DNA to RNA, RNA to proteins is just 1.5 percent versus the non-coding region, non-coding region that is DNA to RNA synthesis is occurring, but RNA to proteins are not forming, non-coding region is the remaining 98.5% and the main role of the non-coding region is in gene regulation. That is all the promoters, enhancers, suppressors, microRNA, everything is in the non-coding region. We have already seen the basics of genetics. This is 117, 30,000 genes. Next, this gets us to our next question. That is 118. Lee any syndrome is because of mutations in P53. Question 118. That is P53. P53. We have again seen this. P53 
it is also called as molecular policeman molecular policeman or or guardian of the genome molecular policeman or guardian of the genome next point just around 20 minutes ago we have seen the action through p p21 and gad45 we have seen that with p53 next it is present on chromosome 17 short arm long arm short arm 17p versus rb gene retinoblastoma gene rb gene which is the governor of the genome now don't ask me the difference between guardian and governor this is a fact p53 is the guardian of the genome versus rb gene which is the governor of the genome present on chromosome 13q so small arm bigger number long arm shorter number 17p 13q next point put a start on this this is an important prospective question the new molecular policeman the new molecular policeman of the genome new molecular policeman of the genome is p10 p10 please have a good look when new molecular policeman is asked you will mark it as p10 but when only molecular policeman is asked you will still mark it as p53 next this gets us to our next question that is question 120 question 120 let us have a look at that my mistake i think i have skipped 119 this was 118 next this gets us to question 119 119 now <coughs> Perivascular pseudorosids. Now, the minute you see this, we have discussed CNS tumors in detail. The minute you see this, even if perivascular pseudorosid, the term was not mentioned, then also just a no history slide. You have blood vessel in the center with presence of small round cells in a rosette like manner. That is, they are present around the blood vessel in a circular manner. Perivascular pseudorosids. How do I know it is a pseudorosid? True rosette has a central lumen. Anything other than a central lumen is a false rosette. Perivascular pseudorosettes, ependymoma. Perivascular pseudorosettes, ependymoma. We have discussed CNS tumors in extensive detail in one of the previous questions. Let us have a look at other options. Glioblastoma, oligodendroglioma. Glioblastoma, glioblastoma. It shows, it shows large serpentine areas of necrosis. It shows large serpentine areas of necrosis with peripheral palisading of tumor cells. I have shown you this image already with peripheral palisading of tumor cells. That is what you will see is a large area of necrosis with tumor cells present in a palisaded manner around it glioblastoma the next microscopic feature is it is also associated with endovascular hypercellularity the endothelial cells have become hypercellular endovascular hypercellularity in turn leading to the formation of glomeruloid body that is it looks like a glomerulus glomeruloid body this is glioblastoma this is glioblastoma and next the next option was ependymoma ependymoma shows the classical fried egg appearance we have again seen this ependymoma shows the classical fried egg appearance so perivascular pseudorosids uh, my mistake oligodendroglioma Oligodendroglioma shows the classical fried egg appearance. My mistake, please correct this. Oligodendroglioma shows fried egg appearance. Ependymoma shows the presence of perivascular pseudorosids. That was the image that you saw. Next, next, this gets us to our next question. That is question 120. Question 120. 57 female, frequent headaches. So elderly female with headaches, 
fever on both fever tenderness on both temples elevated esr now this is the classical presentation of which vasculitis giant cell arthritis whenever somebody th says giant cell arthritis imagine an elderly with thick palpable tender temporal artery so first point first point diagnosis giant cell arthritis giant cell arthritis let us have a look at this is it granulomatous or non granulomatous it is granulomatous in nature wherever giant cells are present it is associated with granulomas granulomatous in nature next point next point it is is seen in elderly more than 50 years with thick thick lid so palpable because of repeated palpations tender thick palpable tender temporal artery involvement so the most common vessel affected temporal artery because temporal of artery is affected it can also lead to ophthalmitis it can lead to ophthalmitis which in turn can cause sudden blindness which in turn can cause sudden blindness as a result giant cell arthritis is a medical emergency it is a medical emergency this is giant cell arthritis next we have already seen that it morphologically both giant cell and takayasu that is the next large vessel vasculitis they are granulomatous so they cannot be differentiated morphologically what is the how do we differentiate them clinically takayasu is seen in is seen in age group less than 50 years and tuk tuk are the pulses so it is pulseless disease next so coming back to the question to prevent it should be immediately treated medical emergency to prevent blindness the answer is a that is it should be immediately treated to prevent blindness it can lead to sudden blindness giant cell arthritis next this gets us to the next question that is 121 121 which is not characteristic of vishness granuloma in vessel wall yes the name tells you that granulomatosis it is granulomatous vasculitis focal necrotizing glomerular nephritis in kidney it causes focal necrotizing glomerular nephritis c anchor positive next it is a small vessel vasculitis not large vessel small vessel so option 4 involves the large vessels is false it is a small vessel vasculitis so involves the large vessels is wrong next now let us have a look at all the points one by one first was of course it is a granulomatous vasculitis so the granulomatous vasculitis r the granulomatous vasculitis r vigenous granulomatosis vigenous granulomatosis chog strauss syndrome chog strauss syndrome next both the large vessel vasculitis giant cell arthritis giant cell arthritis and takayasu syndrome giant cell arthritis and takayasu these are the large vessel vasculitis next the second statement was it is positive for c anca so the anca vasculitis anca anti neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody anca vasculitis i can divide anca into two types c anca cytoplasmic anca and p anca c anca and perinuclear anca the antigen antigen in c anca is proteinase 3 versus p anca where the antigen is myeloperoxidase next the disease associated with c anca remember cow cow c anca vigenous granulomatosis versus p anca which is microscopic pan microscopic pan and chog strauss syndrome microscopic pan and chog strauss this is anca vasculitis anca vasculitis c anca p anca so the small vessel vasculitis are anca positive next the last is it involves the large vessels no it is a small vessel vasculitis so the list of small vessel vasculitis are are
microscopic pan, Wiegner's nematosis, Churg-Strauss syndrome, HSP. In addition to that list, HSP, Henoch-Schonlein purpura, HSP, and and the thromboangitis obliterans. Thromboangitis. This is the ones which is one which is associated with smoking. Thromboangitis obliterans. So it affects both the small and the medium vessels, but the, these are the other small vessel vasculitis. These are the other small vessel vasculitis. And the classification on the basis of size of the vessel. Classification on the basis of size of the vessel has a fancy name to it called as Chapel Hill Nomenclature. Called as Chapel Hill Nomenclature. Classification of vasculitis on the basis of size is Chapel Hill Nomenclature. Next, next, in kidney, in kidney, Wiegner's granulomatosis causes posse immune chrysentric glomerulonephritis. We have already discussed this. It causes posse immune chrysentric glomerulonephritis. Chrysentric is also called as RPGN, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. What is the site of deposit? There is no deposit. It has scant or no deposit. Posse immune chrysentric glomerulonephritis. And a special subtype of it called as focal necrotizing glomerulonephritis. So, in kidney, does Wiegner's cause granuloma formation? No, it does not cause granuloma formation. No granuloma formation. So, Wiegner's is a granulomatous vasculitis, except in kidney where it does not cause granulomas. So, what does it cause in kidney? It causes posse immune chrysentric glomerulonephritis. This is Wiegner's granulomatosis. Next, next, this gets us to the next question, that is question 122. This gets us to the next one, that is 122. Now, have a look at this in a no, no history slide. Nothing is given, just the image. What do you see here? Is it infection or a tumor? This is a tumor. How do I know that? It is showing the presence of similar looking cells in which it is a very cellular slide, but nuclear overlapping is not present. The nuclei, they are molded into each other. Look at any cluster of your choice. The nuclei, they are molded into each other. Nuclear molding, which is a feature of small cell carcinoma. So without history, also this was small cell. Now you have a history of smoking, shortness of breath, small cell carcinoma, lung. In this case, consider this as no history. As such, you know that the most specific lung malignancy associated with smoking is small cell. But that does not in any way contribute to your diagnosis. So answer is D. Answer is D. That is <coughs> small cell carcinoma lung. We have already discussed the microscopy. Microscopically, it shows two features. First is nuclear molding. That is, it is a very cellular slide. But still the nuclei, they are molded into each other. Nuclear overlapping is not present. Nuclear molding, small cell carcinoma. And the next is, it is associated with esopardi effect. Esopardi effect, this is basophilic staining of the vessel wall. The vessel wall appears blue in color. Basophilic staining of vessel wall. Normally, what is blue? Nucleus. So, vessel wall should be pink. Why is the vessel wall blue? Because of entrapment of nuclear material. Entrapment of nuclear material in the vessel wall. And why is the nuclear material getting entrapped? Because of tumor cell necrosis. So, small cell carcinoma lung microscopically shows two features nuclear molding, nuclear molding and esopardi effect, nuclear molding and esopardi effect. Next, next, this gets us to the next question, that is question 123. 
This gets us to specimen of kidney, fibrinoid necrosis, onion peel appearance. Now, the examiner has given you so many hints in this. Just onion peel or just fibrinoid necrosis should have been sufficient. The answer is hyperplastic arteriolitis, 123. The answer is B, that is hyperplastic arteriolitis, hyperplastic arteriolitis. Now, before we go further, let us have a look at hypertension. Nephrosclerosis, that is hypertensive nephrosclerosis, I can divide this into two types. Malignant hypertension affecting the kidney, that is malignant nephrosclerosis versus benign nephrosclerosis. Malignant versus benign nephrosclerosis. First point, starting with gross, starting with gross. Malignant hypertension, the BP is very high, so it leads to rupture of capillaries on the renal capsule. Rupture of capillaries on the renal capsule, giving it the classical flea bitten appearance versus benign hypertension, which has leather grain appearance, versus benign hypertension, which is associated with leather grain appearance. Next point. Microscopy, microscopy, malignant hypertension, the BP is very high. So first point, it is associated with hyperplastic arteriolitis, hyperplastic arteriolitis, that is because of the high BP, the muscle layer around the blood vessel undergoes concentric hyperplasia, hyperplastic arteriolitis giving it the classical onion skin appearance. This was what was asked in the paper, asked by the examiner. Next, the next microscopic feature of malignant nephrosclerosis is, it is also associated with fibrinoid necrosis. Versus benign nephrosclerosis, where the most common arteriolar change, where the most common arteriolar change is hyaline arteriosclerosis. Most common arteriolar change is hyaline arteriosclerosis. Hyaline arteriosclerosis. This is malignant versus benign hypertension. Next point, microscopically, which is more specific for malignant hypertension, hyperplastic arteriolitis or fibrinoid necrosis? More specific, hyperplastic arteriolitis or onion skinning. This is more specific, more specific with malignant hypertension. Why? Because fibrinoid necrosis is seen with a variety of diseases, you know that. Next point, grossly it showed flea bitten appearance. So the minute I see flea bitten appearance, can I put my signature on the report that this is malignant nephrosclerosis? No, I cannot. So this gets us to diseases, diseases associated with flea bitten appearance diseases associated with flea bitten appearance of the kidney. They are, they are, first obviously is malignant hypertension. First is malignant hypertension. Next, flea bitten appearance, it is also seen in PSGN, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, PSGN. Next, Wiechner's granulomatosis, Wiechner's granulomatosis, IgA nephropathy, IgA nephropathy and HSP, IgA nephropathy or Burgess disease and Hinox Schonlein purpura. These are the diseases with flea bitten appearance. Another question that is asked is flea bitten appearance, flea bitten appearance, it is not associated with diabetic nephropathy. Flea bitten, it is not associated with diabetic nephropathy, not associated with diabetic nephropathy. This again is asked. Next point, next point. So before we go further, let us have a look at microscopy in this. Now starting with the first image, what we see here are four structures. The, these two are the tubules. How do I know this? I am even able to see tubular epithelium. Whereas these two, 
वन एंड टू द वन विद द बिगर एरो वन एंड टू दे आर ब्लड वेसल्स हाउ डू आई नो इट इज अ ब्लड वेसल इट इज अल्यूमिनल स्ट्रक्चर इट्स नॉट अ ट्रिब्यून इट्स अ ब्लड वेसल शोइंग यू थिकनिंग ऑफ द वेसल वॉल विद हेलिन मटीरियल हेलिन आर्टीरियोस्क्लिरोसिस हेलिन आर्टीरियोस्क्लिरोसिस नेक्स्ट नेक्स्ट सो बेनाइन हाइपर टेंशन वर्सेस दिस इज अ ब्लड वेसल इट इज अ ल्यूमिनल स्ट्रक्चर विद आर बी सी इज इन द ल्यूमिन इट इज अ ब्लड वेसल शोइंग डिसइंटीग्रेशन ऑफ द वेसल वॉल विद फिब्रिन लाइक मटीरियल फिब्रीनोइड नेक्रोसिस फिब्रीनोइड नेक्रोसिस मेलिग्नेट हाइपर टेंशन डू नॉट कन्फ्यूज हेलिन आर्टीरियोस्क्लिरोसिस विद फिब्रीनोइड नेक्रोसिस नेक्स्ट this is a spotter it is showing you concentric hyperplasia of the muscle layer onion skin appearance hyperplastic arteriolitis hyperplastic arteriolitis or onion skin appearance seen in malignant hypertension seen in malignant hypertension next next this gets us to a next question That is question one twenty four. Question one twenty four. Thirty female gynecologist on microscopic examination shows cystic cavity, hair, keratin debris, skin, thyroid, neural tissue. Everything is seen in this. Everything is seen. So which of the following is the most likely? All of the tissues are similar. No malignant change. Most likely diagnosis: mature teratoma. Question one twenty four. so question 124 the answer is d that is it is a case of mature teratoma it is a case of mature teratoma you very well know i can divide the germ cell tumors of the ovary i can divide germ cell tumors of the ovary into two categories that is dysgerminoma and the non seminomatous dysgerminoma dysgerminoma or let me rephrase it let me rephrase my mistake the mature germ cell tumors the mature germ cell tumors of the ovary and immature which are more common mature or immature mature mature are more common accounting for 95% of the germ cell tumors and the name of the mature germ cell tumor of the ovary is teratoma 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 shows the presence of all three layers it shows all three layers that is ectoderm ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm it shows the presence of all the three layers versus the immature germ cell tumors of the ovary which can be further classified into dysgerminoma dysgerminoma and the non seminomatous tumors dysgerminoma and the non seminomatous non seminomatous tumors which are three main non seminomatous tumors which are which are embryonal carcinoma embryonal carcinoma yolk sac tumor of the ovary and corio carcinoma and corio carcinoma these are the non seminomatous germ cell tumors non seminomatous germ cell tumors next dysgerminoma is the ovarian counterpart it is the ovarian counterpart of seminoma you know this you know this next point so which is the most common germ cell tumor of the ovary this is the classification we divided the germ cell tumors into mature immature this is the classification so most common germ cell tumor of the ovary mature immature mature most common germ cell tumor of the ovary mature germ cell tumor which one teratoma most common immature germ cell tumor of the ovary dysgerminoma so i can safely say which are more common dysgerminomas or the non seminomatous dysgerminoma best prognosis dysgerminoma non seminomatous they are the best prognostic immature germ cell tumors next teratoma 
teratoma. It should all the three layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Which is the most common monodermal teratoma? Most common monodermal teratoma. That is, it has only a single layer. Answer, struma ovari. Struma ovari. That is, it shows the presence of thyroid in ovaries. Most common monodermal teratoma. Struma ovari. Next question. Next question. Most common malignant transformation. Most common malignant transformation in teratoma. That is, which component can convert into malignancy? Squamous. Squamous. Most common malignant transformation. Squamous cell carcinoma. Most common malignant transformation in a teratoma. Squamous cell carcinoma. This is the germ cell tumors of the ovary. Germ cell tumors of the ovary. Next, next. This gets us to our next question. That is question 125. Question 125. Let us have a look at that. Lesions affecting the terminal duct lobular unit, TDLU. This is a very specific term. Terminal duct lobular unit, TDLU, are all except, the answer is 3, intraductal papilloma. Question 125, the answer is 3, that is intraductal papilloma. Intraductal papilloma. TDLU, terminal duct lobular unit, TDLU of the breast, the other three options, the other three options, that is nipple adenomas, nipple adenomas, blunt duct adenosis, blunt duct adenosis, and fibroadenomas, and fibroadenomas arise from TDLU. They are arising from terminal duct lobular unit intraductal papilloma does not. So before we go further, let us have a look at this. This is an important slide. See, have a good look. Let me enlarge this for you. Normally, normal, I am showing you the normal as well as the tumor associated with it. Normally, lobules in the terminal ducts, which I have a good look, they give rise to cis sclerosing adenosis, small duct papillomas, hyperplasias, atypical hyperplasias and carcinomas. Large ducts, please note large duct papilloma is not from the lobule, it is a large duct lesion. So TDLU, terminal duct lobular unit, answer was C, intraductal papilloma. Paget's disease, duct ectasias, they are the large duct. All the adenosis, hyperplasias were lobules. Intralobular stroma was fibroadenoma and phyllodes. Interlobular is fat necrosis, lipomas, sarcomas. This is an important slide. Please have a good look at this. Please have a good look. Terminal duct lobular unit, intraductal papilloma is not originating from that. The other three are. 